Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is History 102, part of the Great Big History Podcast. Today we start part three of our class from 1950 to, to, to present time, and we start with Disneyland's and the modern world. So Disneyland's are, are born out of optimism, which is a big deal because the people who built Disneyland all lived through the Great Depression and the Second World War, which is the opposite of optimism. So they represent this concept of if you can dream it, then you can do it. That's optimism. We're going to take a bunch of orange groves. We're going to take a bunch of farm fields and we're going to turn it into the happiest place on earth. Well, why? Why is America optimistic enough to build a Disneyland? Well, after 1945, America was wealthy. It was one of the few wealthy countries on earth. It was the wealthiest country on earth. The war industries, the po post-war boom building of Europe brought in lots of money and jobs. It hadn't been ravaged except for Hawaii. It hadn't been ravaged by the war. It had factories that could now be turned from war material to consumer goods. Uh, nobody could spend anything during the war, so they made all this money and they poured it into their savings accounts. They bought war bonds, which earned them interest. They were healthy. America was a healthier place. Lots of New Deal social programs help people get homes in the suburbs, get high school and college educations. That's the GI Bill. 20 million men came home from the war and a lot of them went to college, which they could never have done before. There's vaccines in the 50s for polio. There's medicine. There's retirement and Social Security. Americans were living longer and better. When my grandmother was born in the 19 teens, she expected to live to be about 40, 45. She died in her 90s. That's in one part. That's that's what the New Deal and the health and the science all did. It doubled people's lifespan so that today nobody expects to live 40. If you live to be 40, that's terrible. It's a tragedy. You died young. The average age is in the 70s to the 80s, depending on which demographic you are. And also, America was getting younger. There was a baby boom. These are the people who are now the old folk today who are the boomers. But from 1948 to 1964, there was a boom. More babies were born than at any point, almost any point in the 20th century. It was an absolute boom. The country got younger. And so young people matter in economics and politics. And you see this all over the place. You see this in the books that are being written, whether it's On the Road or um, Catcher in the Rye, which are about young men dealing with the world. It's uh, about the rise of the Beatles in the 60s and rock and roll. All of this is young people's Woodstock. No old people at Woodstock. I mean, there were but you see it in, in The Simpsons, right? When Homer goes back in time, when he's a young man, he's in the 60s. Yo, Dad, we're never going to get old. And Grandpa's like, I used to be young and I used to be with it. But that was America. America was full of babies. You, you live in an old world. I'm sorry, but you do. The average age of an American went from the... Um, went from the 30s or early 40s to now it's the 50s. We have more 80-year-olds in the Senate than we have 30-year-olds. You live in a world... I'm an Xer, so I'm the generation right after the boomers. And we're the slacker generation. Why? Because we can't do anything. We're not big enough. So what point was there? We're never, we're, we're so small, we're not even going to probably get a president. Right? Kamala is a boomer. Biden is a pre-boomer. The silent generation, quote unquote, is a war generation.
So the world got younger. And so you get childhood plays, Christmas toys, television shows, 18 year old voting, the voting, the voting turned from 21 to 18. You get rock and roll. Everything became about young people, which is why the boomers became the me generation in the eighties when they started to buy stuff, when they stopped being kids and started buying homes and became the me generation. And now they're the okay boomer generation. They still hold on to power. They're still the Disney. And since this is a Disney actually does more advertising now, spends more money advertising to grandparents than to parents. Why? Because the parents don't have money. The grandparents have money. The boomers have money. Millennials don't have money. The average millennial doesn't even own a home yet. Until well into their 30s. Boomers own their homes in their 20s. The middle class needed a healthy, wealthy way of spending its leisure time. It was young. It was healthy. It was wealthy. So it wanted to spend its money on something better, a better place for their kids. The amusement parks of the 1900s of the 1920s were seedy. Think of the places that come to town, the circuses, right? The car. Think about your idea of a carny, right? You're like, ah, ah, you know. These guys come into town, no teeth, you know, hitting on all the young girls. You know, who knows what diseases they're bringing or where they're going. That's the, that's the circus. For as long as there's been history, there's been, as long as there's been cities, there's been circuses of people going from town to town to town, offering things, the carnival, right? Here's the, the fun thing that's going to happen. But it was, it's also seedy. It's undignified. And so this new middle class coming out of World War II wanted a healthy, wealthy way of spending their leisure time. And that's going to be Disneyland. That's dignified. That's middle class. I, when I was in school, when I was in elementary school, it was a rite of passage for young, white, suburban New York um, children to go to Disney World. At some point you went, since we're on the East Coast, we went to Disney World. And the idea was it was going to happen sooner or later because you parents were bad parents if they didn't. So you stay saved up for a few years and they went, we're going. And there's actually a whole advertisement, right? Of the kids getting a present that's, we're going to Disneyland, right? Now, my wife, Dr. Elizabeth O'Connell Janeri, is an expert in this, and this is part of this comes out of her research. And she has a whole class on this topic at Rowan University. Um, she sometimes does a similar class at uh, the Burlington Historical Society. And so you should take it if you end up at, at Rowan. Um, and the idea is that it was an aspirational, middle-class, wholesome family entertainment. What does that mean? One, it's expensive. Even for the middle class, it's expensive. But it's obtainable by working families, especially this white middle class. It's not something you could do multiple times a year. It's not something you could do every year, like going to the Jersey Shore. It's something you had to save up for. But it was obtainable by an ordinary working class person working in a factory. Now that person was mostly white and in, and part of a union, but it wasn't locked out to African-Americans, to immigrants. And it was a staple of, I have made the middle class. I have enough money to travel to Disneyland or later Disney world spend this boat boatload of money on my kids so it becomes this rite of passage i did this kind of like lawyers buying a mercedes or 40 year old guys getting a porsche when they're going through a midlife crisis it's a thing that middle class families especially white middle class families did three it's anti-depression 
It's anti the 30s. It's anti the 40s. The entire thought is we can create a fantasy land in the middle of orange groves. We can mold nature. We could change the economics. We can create culture to link a company, Disney, to families. So that it's Disney World, Disneyland. So you have, you, when you go to Disneyland, you think Disney is a great company and Mr. Disney is a great guy. And it represents America. One of the geniuses that separates Disneyland from the carnivals, which just arrives, is that Disneyland themed itself as representing the values of America. And so when you arrive, you arrive on Main Street, Main Street, USA, which is this nostalgia for an older America that never was. It never really was. It looks like a Midwestern town around 1900. It's commerce. It's all commerce. It's all commerce. It's horses and buggies, but there's no poo. There's lots of stores, but no pickpockets. There's not much traffic on the streets. You're not going to get run over. The smells are of the bakery, the candy shop, and all the people working in the stores are nice. So it's a nostalgia for a main street of a Midwestern town that's in a condition that never existed. It looks like one, but it's a facade of one because the main street town of a Midwest of, of the Midwest had poo, had pickpockets, had drunkards, had homeless, had all kinds of stuff that Disneyland doesn't have. It has Mr. Lincoln. Disneyland has this. If you're a Disney World person, you might go, wait, what? But Disneyland has Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln telling you about America, telling you about American values. Mr. Lincoln is going to get up there and tell you how great America is. So again, a nostalgia for who? For the greatest president. Not for someone controversial like FDR. Not a progressive like Teddy Roosevelt. Not a conservative like Coolidge. But an undisputable hero of America. Mr. Lincoln. Plus is a frontier land. It's the old west. But there's no violence. There's no dysentery. There's no death. Instead, there's bathrooms, hamburgers, and Coke. So there's comfort. It looks like the Old West. But it doesn't have any of the negatives of the Old West. It's a facade. And in its place are all these modern conveniences. And then you can leave the Old West. And go to Tomorrowland, which is about hope for the future. Space Mountain is about future space travel. The house of tomorrow is better home technology today. Capitalism and technology equals adventure. All of the places in, in Tomorrowland were brought to you by companies. If you look in the picture uh, on the video, it's General Dynamics, RCA, big companies promising you the future. And what's the future going to be? Awesome. The sky's the limit. And then there's Fantasyland. What's Fantasyland? It doesn't exist in reality. Even in even like Main Street in a fake reality or Frontierland in this nostalgic reality. Fantasyland is childhood. It's fun. It's carefree. It's innocent. It's a small world. It's a small world. Children unite the world. We can all agree that children are awesome. You can meet princesses in real life. There's Cinderella, Snow White, Aurora. You could fly with Peter Pan, fly over London. This is still an age before jet travel. You can't go to London. Only the rich, rich, rich could go to London. Now, on Peter Pan's ride. You could fly over Big Ben. 
with little cars moving underneath you. And I'm going to tell you, if you're not blown away, I'm, I am a, I am now a middle-aged person. I have been blown away by that scene in Peter Pan my entire life. I have been to London, and it's still cool to fly over it with Peter Pan. You get to go into a storybook with Winnie the Pooh and under the sea with Captain Nemo. Fantasyland brings stories and books and movies to life. Disney's stories, Disney's books, Disney's movies, but it comes to life and you can participate in it. You're not passive anymore. And that is new. Carnivals couldn't do that. The amusement parks of New York couldn't do that. Couldn't bring you into these worlds. And it is for everybody. It's childhood for everybody. Everybody gets to go rain, 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 raining down on Piglet, right? With Winnie the Pooh. Everybody gets to participate. So what about Walt Disney World in Florida? Well, they have a Dis they have a Magic Kingdom, they have a Disneyland. We call it Magic Kingdom, but it's it's a Disneyland and it works essentially the same way. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they work the same way. But the big innovation at Disney World is Epcot, which opens up in 1983, E-P-C-O-T. And what Epcot is, is a World's Fair. Remember we talked about the World's Fair? Where the Eiffel Tower is built, where the Crystal Palace is built? Well, the World's Fair is you get to see the world without leaving the United States. Most Americans are never going to leave the United States. Most Americans never leave the United States. Most Americans do don't have a passport. So this is safety. This is the world has come to you and it's safe. You don't have to be like a European vacation, you know, National Lampoon's European vacation where everyone's trying to steal from you, where the French waiters hate you, where you can't drive in England because you don't understand the rules of the road and you get stuck in the turnabouts. The Germans are just drunkards. Like, you, you know, you could stay in America and still see the world. There's an Eiffel Tower. There's a Mexican Aztec temple. And you get familiarity. Everyone speaks English. The bathrooms are free. You don't have to deal with trying to find someone who speaks English or pretends that they don't speak English. Ever, ever talk to somebody, and it's happened. I've been in Spain when I tried to get directions from somebody who was on a break, and they're like, no habla, uh, you know, ingles. And I'm like, you are 22 years old. Of course you habla ingles. Don't give me that. But be that as it may, in, in Disney, in Epcot, in the World's Fair, everybody speaks English. The foreigners there like you. There are no pickpockets, no mean French waiters. And you may go, wait, why, why would you keep talking about pickpockets? Well, I've known plenty of people who have traveled around Europe and they all come back with the same story. I've traveled around Europe. I haven't gotten pickpocketed, but I know several people who come back and they're like, I fell asleep on the train going from Rome to Tur Turin and I woke up and I didn't have any money. You know, the Spanish steps in Rome are famous for their pickpockets famous for their pickpockets you know the food is americanized world food there's baguettes there's lamb kebab there's english pub food but it's all flavored in an american sort of way so you can order anything it's all you're gonna be fine there's nothing really scary you could get alcohol unlike in disneyland slash magic kingdom there are a few rides but it's an adult more than a kid world. It's an adult world. It's the World's Fair is really built for adults. There's alcohol. There's only a few rides. But it allows you to walk around the world, see the world without having to actually go anywhere, which most Americans appreciate. They're not going to go. Flying to Europe is expensive. 
And then you only get to see one country. So then you have to fly to another country. And now it's expensive. And you have to stay in these places. So you could do it in a mile. So you get exercise and sushi. You get German beer and English fish and chips. Well, what about Tokyo Disneyland? So now we're going to do Disneyland outside of America. Well, Disney movies and shorts were big in Japan. It gave rise to anime, Japanese animation, especially of Japanese stories and originals, which itself came from a magna tradition. Manga tradition, excuse me. Walt's death in 1966, plus the building of Disney World and the Magic Kingdom, plus the 70s were bad for Disney movies, and oh man, they were stinkers. Like the telekinetic cat. Woo! Though, as an Xer, I appreciated the dark um, take on sci-fi. Tron, um, the black hole where they go to hell. I mean... You know, these are these these are year these are movies that are made after Star Wars, which is you know kid friendly. Ah, bing bing bing, you know, laser wizard, but before um, Terminator, which is real dark, and especially um, Blade Runner. And they're built. They're made around the time of Alien, and so you have to give Disney credit for making some dark sci-fi movies. Um, so I appreciate them, even if they didn't make any money. I rem- I, I went and saw Tron in the movie theaters. I re- we walked out of it, and uh, my mother's like, you know, I don't understand any of that. I, and I'm like, it was they, they're in a video game. It's you know, she's like, I don't, I didn't get any of that. I, you know, I, I was like, yeah, generations, right? Sci-fi, but it meant all of this. Walt's death, the building of Disney World, the um. The 70s being bad for movies meant Disney needed money. And here comes a company, the Oriental Land Company. They approach Disney and they want to bring Disneyland to Japan. And what they want is the Western Land, the Toontown, the Tomorrowland. Now, the Western Land is interesting because remember... To Japan, the West is China. There is no frontier in Japan. Now, there's samurais, and the 50s and the 60s are going to make the samurai to the Western uh, Old West gunslinger connections. Uh, The most famous, of course, is the Seven Samurai becoming the Magnificent Seven. But there is no frontier in Japan. The West is China, which is a giant civilization of you know, cities and, you know, people. So there's no Western tradition. Remember that when we talk about Disneyland's in China. So what is the result? Disney licenses their intellectual property. The Oriental Land Company builds an exact replica of Walt Disney World. It's a win-win. Disneyland Tokyo looks like the Magic Kingdom, has the same Cinderella Castle, the same Haunted Mansion, despite the cultural differences. Remember, in Buddhism, there are no ghosts. Friendly or vicious. The ancestors are there to help you. Right? But they're not, they're they're spirits, yes, but they're not ghosts wandering around going, There's, there's none of that in Buddhism. There's the same American Old West called Western Land, despite there not being an Old West in Japan, and the same Space Mountain. It was Japan bringing America to the Japanese. They didn't want to Jap- uh, Japanese fight it. They didn't want to put their own cultural spin on it. They wanted America in Japan. Why? Well, because Japan was doing was doing well. The Japanese were doing well in 1980. The economy was good. America was seen as awesome. But it's far away. It's strange. It's very big. 
and it's Anglo-European. So it's, it's not approachable. Like you go to America, you're always the outsider. You're always Japanese, right? You're a foreigner in a strange land. So what Tokyo Disneyland creates is a safe space, kind of like um, Epcot's World Fair creates a safe space for Americans to, to deal with world or European culture. Tokyo Disneyland creates a safe space for Japanese consumers to dip into American culture without being swallowed by it, without having to deal with like New York, you know, the taxis and the noise and the 50 and the, uh, the 42nd street and the shows and the pickpockets and the, it's a safe space for indulgence. It works like Epcot's world showcase. It's massively popular. It's so popular it needs a second gate. It needs a second theme park because the the Disneyland cannot hold all the people who want to go to it. So like, oh, we'll open up another park. It becomes the model also for Disneyland expansions into Europe, which fail, Hong Kong and Shanghai. The idea that we'll copy it. Now, if it works in Tokyo, we can export it to other places. The major innovation of Tokyo Disneyland is the World Bazaar. That instead of the nostalgia of a U.S. small town, which Japan does not have, they instead invoke the Crystal Palace World Fair of 1851. That Disney wanted the World Fair, wanted a World Fair, but the Oriental Land Company wanted Disneyland, quote unquote. And so what they did was combine them. So it has the parts of Main Street USA, but it's adapted for the weather because it snows in Tokyo. It has a roof, but it invokes this brilliance of Victorian, of the Victorian height. So the Japanese enter into Americana. It is Walt Disney World in Japan that the Oriental Land Company is selling. It's not a Japanese take on Disneyland, but also, and this is a nice little touch, the Crystal Palace World Fair is an invocation of the Meiji Restoration, of the industrialization of Japan, of Japan leaving the Middle Ages and becoming a modern power, but before the conquest of Korea, the destruction of, of the war, the Second World War, the fascism, the, the militarism. It's when Japan is becoming powerful. So it's a nostalgia. Even in this, it's not a nostalgia directly. But it's a reference to the World's Fair is what was the height of technology in 1851, just as Japan was becoming a world power. So Japan is included in this. In the World's Fair, in the Crystal Palace. So... They could have picked anything, and it's interesting they picked the Crystal Palace. Now, on the other hand, the building of Disney Sea is completely different. The failure of California land at Disneyland in the 90s meant Disney was in trouble in building stuff in America. And what Japan does is take the best of American engineering. The American parks are stuck with boom and nostalgia. They can't really change. They can't really innovate. You can't get rid of Pirates of the Caribbean. Why? Because the boomers are taking their kids. And then later, they're taking their grandkids. And they want to show them what they saw when they were kids. And so as America got older, Disneyland's stayed the same. They couldn't innovate. If you look at the early maps of Disneyland, there's lots of changes. There used to be a horse and buggy ride, a, 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 a carriage ride through the Old West. They got rid of that. There was uh, Davy Crockett's canoes. They got rid of that, or at least they got rid of that in where you, where you canoed yourself. They got rid of that at Disney, Disney World. They, were, they constantly were changing. And you could go, well, they're constantly changing out. Yeah and no. Because... Peter Pan's ride hasn't really changed. Space Mountain hasn't really changed. Pirates of the Caribbean, they added Johnny Depp, and then they haven't changed it since. 
and even people freaked out then. So American parks are stuck with this boomer nostalgia and Disneyland's worse than Disney World in this case. You really can't change Disneyland because it's where Walt walked. You know, it is he worked on on the Haunted Mansion. You can't change that because every time you change it, you're losing a piece of Walt. So but in Japan, Japan is able to out Disney Disney because it's not tied to that boomer nostalgia. It can do something innovative. And that's what Disney C is in the 1990s and early 2000s. It's the newest rides. The newest shows are going to be in the Asian parks. And if they're popular and safe, they're brought to the USA. Which is a export of culture back to America, like video games. Remember, video games were invented in America. Then they went to Japan. And now they're coming back to America. Electronics. All of the TVs, all of the radios all, were all built in America. And then all those companies folded as they began being made in Japan and Taiwan. So what is happening in American economics is reflected in Disney. That they are, they are an American company that is making culture in Asia and then exporting it from Asia and bringing it to the United States. In the 1990s and early 2000s. In China. China is so big it has two Disneylands. One in Hong Kong. One in Shanghai. What does this show? Well one it shows a love of American culture. There is the main streets. There are the castles. There's changed. But they are what they are. China does not have castles. China does not have German fantasy castles. It has its own architectural style for its grand buildings. And yet they built castles. They built Cinderella's castle. They have technological innovations. Pirates of the Caribbean in Shanghai versus Pirates of the Caribbean that you can see it's down below. It's this giant monstrosity of video and light and action and movement and water shooting in your face. While Pirates of the Caribbean is a nice little ride where, you know, little things move around you. Yo, ho, 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 a pirate's life for me. And it's cool. But it's not blow your mind crazy. They have Mystic Manor instead of a haunted mansion. There are no ghosts. Because, again, Buddhism doesn't have a history of malevolent ghosts. So they change it. The Chinese middle class wants entertainment and leisure. Remember, China after Tiananmen Square, and we're going to talk about this in a future lecture, but as China grows, 800 million people will leave poverty. It is the greatest transfer, or I shouldn't say transfer of wealth, because that's not what it is. It's the greatest collection of wealth among people in the history of the world. It's as if all of Europe went from poverty to middle class in a decade instead of the century it took. And what do they want? They want something to spend their money on. They want entertainment and they want leisure. And Chinese companies were not able to provide it. So that meant there was money. Now that's not an insult to Chinese companies. That's a they had they had no they were export driven. They weren't domestic driven. And more importantly, they were making things for the world to buy, not to entertain the world. We'll talk about this when we do China. They don't have the experience for it. As time will go on, we will see more D Chinese companies do what Disney can do. But at the moment, Disney does it better than anybody else. And so Chinese middle classes wanted access to Disney. But. Disney couldn't just plop down to Disneyland. Disney capitalism, in order to get access to that middle class, had to compromise with the limitations of the Chinese Communist Party. So that Mr. Lincoln talking about freedom and democracy, no, he's not going to be there. Right? There's a lot less talk of freedom, of human rights, of capitalism, of democracy, which are all over Disneyland and Disney World. All over Disneyland and Disney World. There's constant talks about freedom and human rights and capitalism. 
from the very fact that that corporations sponsor the rides and have advertisements. This ride is brought to you by GE. You know? What the Chinese Disneyland's do is change Disneyland to the culture of the rides, unlike Japan, which kept it. Japan keeps the Americana. In China, they're going to change them to fit Chinese culture in order to make the ride more appropriate to the Chinese mainland culture. So what do we see? What we see is from 1950 to 1990, Disneyland reflected the hopes, promise, power, and fun of a youthful America. From 1990 to the present, Disneyland's are more innovative in Asia and reflect a middle-class Asian values for Asian folk rather than exporting American values to Japanese and, and Chinese. Disneyland's in Asia are exporting rides and experiences to Disney USA, which again, as I spoke, symbolizes the general trend in American economics from 1980 to the present. So in the 80s, it was Japan is taken over. You know, there's a movie and then a TV show called Gung Ho about Japanese taking over American car plants. And how are Americans going to deal with that? Well, we bought Toyotas, right? The Toyota Corolla has been the number one selling car for 30 years. You know, but in the 80s, it was this, oh, my God, Japan is catching up. And now we're importing Disney stories from Japan and China to and Disney rides right now, as we're speaking, uh, Disney World is building a Tron roller coaster. That Tron roller coaster is an exact replica of the Tron roller coaster from Shanghai. It wasn't invented in America and then shipped to Shanghai. It was invented in Shanghai by the American company. And then is being shipped to America. Just that's Apple computer, right? That's your iPhone. An American company designs the iPhone. It's made in China and then it's shipped back to America. So Disney culturally is representing what's going on in manufacturing in the larger economic trends in the West. Okay. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed.